السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعين به ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله تعالى من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا وحبيبنا وأسوتنا وقائدنا محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه جمعين وعلى كل من تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما سبحانك اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم وبعد respected brothers and sisters <coughs> once again alhamdulillah it's an honor it's a privilege to be here with you at this masjid and I thank the organizers for inviting me and all of you as well for coming today inshallah and we hope to discuss a very important topic as it was introduced that previously over the past year or so I started this series of talks wherein in the beginning I explained that some of the ulama this is not in the hadith or the Quran but some of the early scholars and the recent scholars the ulama of this ummah by looking at the various laws and injunctions ahkam and rules of Islam and Sharia which are found in the Quran and in the hadith they categorize these laws into five different categories if you look at the Quran you'll find the different various laws that they are all relating to they all pertain and relate to these five categories so for example if you read Surah Al-Baqarah the verses of Surah Al-Baqarah, you'll see that Allah talks about matters of the unseen and ilm al-ghayb and the life hereafter, which is all to do with one's aqidah and one's belief. And you'll find many verses connected to relating to one's aqidah. And then you have verses to do with how you pray, like Allah says, aqimu salah, offer salah, pray, atu zakah, wa atimu al-hajja wal umrata lillah. So there are laws to do with fiqh. Which, and then fiqh, we have ibadat, worshipping Allah. There are laws to do with Mu'ashara, which was category number three. And I mentioned in the beginning that we will not be discussing the first two categories of Aqidah and Ibadat, worshipping Allah. But we had one whole lecture and a program here on which was titled Obligation to the Creation of Allah, which means the Hukuq al-Ibad. And this, ter this category has been termed Mu'ashara, which means to live with one another, social injunctions. Like if you read Surah Al-Hujarat, Allah talks about all the laws of how to interact with one another as Muslims, as human beings, social etiquettes. And then you have verses of the Quran and many hadiths relating to financial business transactions. So that becomes a category as well, mu'amalat. So you have mu'ashara and then you have mu'amalat. So we did a whole talk and a program on mu'ashara titled Obligation to the Creation of Allah. And then we had a discussion on mu'amalat, business dealings in Islam, which was I think titled Deal or No Deal. Uh, the financial transactions in Islam and we had a whole talk on that and the fifth category which can be termed as the category of akhlaq or tazkiyatul qalb which is to do with the purification of the heart and purification of the soul and we find many verses of the Quran and many hadiths of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that deal with this particular area and category category of the laws of the heart so this is the classification and categorization but what I want to say today before we go on to explain some very important things is that there is also another classification and categorization you see because the, this categorization and classification is not based on a particular well it's not explicitly based on a particular verse of the Quran or a hadith but this is what the, when the ulama, the scholars, the early imams and the salaf, when they look at the various laws of the Quran and Sunnah, they, according to their understanding, they say, okay, you can divide them into these categories. You can even divide them into 10 categories if you want to. Mu'ashara, you can say, okay, 
laws con uh, relating to the rights of your family members, one category. Laws relating to the hukuk and rights of fellow Muslims, another category. So you've made two categories out of one category. Laws connected to uh, the rights and interaction with non-Muslims, another, another category. So you can do that, it's not a problem. But there is another classification which I want to explain and this will take us to this fifth category. The other classification categorization of the various laws of Islam is that Islamic laws injunctions are only divided into three. And this is actually based implicitly on a hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When we read, when we look at the ahkam, the laws, when we look at the Quran and Sunnah, when we read the verses of the Quran, and when we, when we read the hadiths of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi wa Alihi wa Sahbihi wa Sallam, we see that there are certain texts that deal with, again, just like the five classification, the five categories that I mentioned, likewise here as well, the first category is Aqeedah. Okay? So, everything a Muslim must believe in and must not believe in is involved in this category. This is Aqeedah, the belief system known as Islamic creed, the belief system. Many verses, like I said, Surah Al-Baqarah, and numerous verses. And, and the things that Allah tells us not to believe in, the things we must believe in about Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala himself, all the attributes of Allah, it's a topic, science on its own, and it's something that we should, as Muslims, study, take time out. In the beginning, I'll tell you one thing before I carry on, in the beginning of Islam, in the time of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and even in the time of the Sahaba, earlier on in the Qurun Al-Ula, the early times, there was no classification. There was no classification. If a Sahabi, a companion, had a question or an issue or a problem to do with any matter of his life and his religion, what would he do? Go to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and say, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, I have a problem, I need to know the, the Islamic ruling about a matter of divorce. I have an issue, I need to know about this matter of Aqeedah. Is there punishment in the grave, for example? I have an issue to do with business transactions. I have an issue, I want to know something about my rights with my wife or my husband. Any matter of Islam, they would go and ask the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Deen was simple, people were less, it didn't spread far and wide. There were very less few people in the beginning. So there was no, classifi there was no need for a classification. And everything to do with Islam was termed as Deen. There was only one term, Deen. In the Deen عند الله Islam. And another term was also used which was Fiqh. Fiqh right now, I'll, tell, I'll explain later, is used in a different way. But in the earlier times, and in the Quran and Sunnah, the term used was only fiqh. Fiqh means understanding of deen. So like for example, Allah says in the Quran, فَلَوْلَا نَفَرَ مِنْ كُلِّ فِرْقَةٍ مِّنْهُمْ طَائِفَةٌ لِيَتَفَقَّهُ فِي الدِّينِ وَلِيُنذِرُ قَوْمَهُمْ إِذَا رَجَعُوا إِلَيْهِمْ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَحْذَرُونَ Allah talks about why is there not a group of people? There should be some people who learn the matters of faith and deen and have a good deep understanding of deen they become scholars they should b dedicate their life to studying deen and let the others go in jihad and in striving and struggling and travel and do whatever they need to do and then these people are the scholars and the others will follow them in other words allah is saying in the quran that there must be a group of people who are the imams who are the scholars who are the mujtahids not everybody become, can become a lawyer not everyone can become a barrister otherwise all the barristers and lawyers will lose their job if every one of us is a doctor you know we won't, we won't we won't have a job left likewise only a group of scholars need to be experts in islamic sciences the rest follow them and this is what we call taqlid and which is another topic altogether but in this verse allah is saying they should understand deen the, the term used is tafaqqu fiqh one term was used in the beginning of islam in the hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, مَن يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُفَقِّهُ فِي الدِّينِ With whom Allah intends good, he gives him an understanding of deen. This does not only relate to jurisprudence, it's a comprehensive understanding of deen. So in the beginning of Islam, in the time of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there was no classification. There was only one term used, which is fiqh, or deen, deen, Islam, that's it. Islam, deen these one or two terms 
which related to every single hukam injunction of Islam. This is, this is an introduction which is very important to understand some of the very other important things that I want to talk about, but without understanding this introduction, it will be difficult to understand some things that I want to talk about. And I'm going to be quite frank about some issues, but they need to be said. So, in the, there's no classification. There was only one, one term, deen and sharia or Islam, these terms. Okay? But then, as time passed, more and more people started becoming interested in Islam and they embraced Islam and Islam spread far and wide. New issues came into the open. There were new issues that faced the Muslims. There were people who were coming into Islam with corrupt beliefs. People were being deviated. New groups came into existence. So many different sects, like you must have heard of groups like the Mu'tazila and the Khawarij and the Jabariya and the Qadariya. Numerous different sects started coming into the Muslim community, right? Now, at that time, the Muslims in the time of the Tabi'un and the Atba'u Tabi'in, these are the people after the Sahaba, some of the Muslim scholars, they said, you know what, it's very important that we actually teach ourselves, our children, our Muslim communities about the matters of faith as explained by the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba, the methodology, the manhaj of the Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And some scholars, they dedicated their life to this one topic which is from the Quran and Sunnah of Aqeedah. So you had great scholars of the past who actually devoted, dedicated their whole life, their time, their efforts and their works to just the science of Aqeedah. They became known for the science of Aqeedah. It became a science, a topic, a subject in of itself. In the time of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there was no, okay, you know, there was no such a thing like we'll, we'll have a course today on Aqeedah. You know, nowadays we have course on Aqeedah. Was it a course on Aqeedah in the time of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Of course not. There's no such a thing as Aqeedah, Fiqh, whatever, all the different categories. It's only one deen. But later on, because of a need, this classification took place. So, the first category, the laws of Aqeedah, the things, and these things were discussed, and these things were taught, and there were books were written on it. The things that we must believe in in terms of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His attributes, there are a lot of things that we must believe in. And which means like Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and Him not being like anything, Laysa kamithli his shay. And books have been written as you know. And the things that we must not believe in, the things that we must avoid like shirk and associating partners with Allah. And many other things. There are attributes of the messengers that we must believe in. There are certain things that are contrary to a person being a messenger and the matters of the unseen and there are numerous things and like we have books written on this topic Imam Tahawi rahimahullah wrote a book Bayanu Ahli Sunnah Wal Jama'ah known as Al-Aqidatu Tahawiyya which is a very short brief text right in the time of Sahaba did they read a text let's read a book text in Aqidah no they would just take the Aqidah from the Quran and Sunnah but later on books were being written so this was the first category of Islamic laws or the injunctions or the ahkam of Quran and Sunnah which is the category of Aqeedah, taken from the Quran and Sunnah. The second category of laws, the second category of laws, are those ahkam and those laws and those injunctions of the Quran and Sunnah, of Sharia, of the Quran and Sunnah, not the Bible or the Torah or the Zabur or the Injil or some other book. These are the laws of the Quran and Sunnah, right? that deal with the external physical body of the human the external laws like all the laws concerning tahara purification how to purify yourself the laws of purity all the ahkam all the laws found in the quran and sunnah to do with wudu to do with the ghusl to do with tayammum for women for females about menstruation about hayd and nifas and postnatal bleeding tayammum wiping on leather socks etc etc and all the laws to do with um, uh, worshipping Allah, offering salah and zakat and hajj and down there we said ibadat mu'ashara mu'amala but here ibadat mu'ashara mu'amalat all of them have been put into this second category so those five categories was aqeedah and then you have ibadat mu'ashara mu'amala in other words what's happening here is that those five have become three in such a way that the first one remains the first same category the middle the ibadat, the mu'ashara and mu'amalat the middle three, they become one category and the last one remains the last one which we're going to talk about today and which I'm moving on to. So this is how it's happened. 
all the laws, external laws, laws connected to fasting, zakat, hajj, umrah, um, marriage, divorce, business transaction, financial transactions, renting, hiring, wills, everything to do with the physical body, hurting someone, and all the, all the commands and prohibitions, just like in Aqidah, in the first category, we have what we call Awamir and we have Nawahi. What do we have? Awamir and Nawahi, which means the do's and don'ts, the commands and the prohibitions. In the first category, what do we have? The do's and don'ts. The do's are the things we must believe in and the prohibitions are the things we must avoid. Likewise, in this second category, there are commands and prohibitions. Commands, Allah says, offer prayer. That's a command. Aqimu salah wa atu zakah. Do your hajj, perform and offer your hajj if you have the means. That's a command. The prohibition is La taqrabu zina. Don't even come close to fornication. It's haram. Do not backbite. Now that's a ruling to do with mu'ashara, but it's in the second category of external because you backbite with your normally with your mouth. You know, it's external. Even though the scholars have said there's a backbiting of the mind as well. Really, you know, if you think negatively of people, it's kind of backbiting. But it's more or less to do with the external body. Hitting someone, physical abuse. These are all the prohibitions. Just like we have the commands and prohibitions of the first category, we have the commands and prohibitions. Halallahu al wa haram al riba. Being engaged and involved in usury and interest transactions, it's absolutely haram. It's, it's a physical action, it's an external law. Again, it's a, to do with the second category. This second category was termed the category of fiqh. In the beginning, as I said, one term fiqh was used for everything. But now, later on, do you understand what I point now? In the beginning, there was one term which was deen or fiqh or sharia, mainly deen and fiqh, used for everything. But now, when this classification took place, the first category was known as aqidah. And not just aqidah, there were different names, actually. You know, the first category, not just one name. Because remember, names are not important. It's just what the scholars thought they can term. The first category, some of them called it Ilm Usuluddin. Some called it Ilm Tawheed, the science of Tawheed, because Tawheed is one of the very important issues discussed in Aqidah. Some called it um, Ilm Al Kalam. Different names were given to this first category. The second category is, as I said, known as Fiqh which now we translate as jurisprudence, fiqh. All the laws to do with the external body. And that's why there's a definition of fiqh. The ulama give a definition when they explain, they said, that it's a science that deal with amal, amaliyya, external actions, which are derived from its detailed proofs, which are the Quran and Sunnah. So all the laws of the Qur'an and Sunnah to do with the external body, with the external of the human, zahir, a'mal al-zahira, they fit into this second category known as the category of al-fiqh. One of the imams of this ummah, Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah wa radiya anhu, he wrote, well there's a book, some say he wrote, some say it's attributed to him, a book called al-fiqh al-akbar. Major fiqh. This book was to do with aqidah. Now he was very early on. He was very early on. Before the classification took place. In his time, fiqh was used for everything like the time of the Sahaba. So now how do you distinguish between aqidah and fiqh? So you say aqidah is a bigger fiqh and the external law, salah, zakat, hajj is a lesser degree of fiqh. And this is why he called his book Al-Fiqh Al-Akbar, which means Aqidah, as opposed to Al-Fiqh Al-Asghar, the smaller fiqh which deals with Salah, Zakat, Hajj, Umrah, marriage, divorce, inheritance, will, etc. But after his time, remember Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, was born in 80 Hijri. He saw some of the Sahaba, he met them, he was from the Tabi'un, and this classification took place after his time, in the time in the 3rd century, in the time of people like Imam Al-Bukhari and Imam Al-Tirmidhi and all these other great Imams of this Ummah, who all of them came after the time of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. So, this second category is known as the category of fiqh. And then we have the third category and that's 
very important in our discussion today. The third category of the laws, again, these are the laws of the Quran and Sunnah, not the Bible, not the Torah, not the Zabur, not the Injil, or not some book that you're going to buy from W.H. Smith or anywhere. It's the Quran and Sunnah, right? Everybody loves this, and we should. The Quran and Sunnah laws, ahkam, injunctions taken out, derived from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the hadiths and the sayings and the traditions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that deal with the inner self, the heart, the soul, the, the qalb, right? Just as we have commands and we have prohibitions, we have commands and prohibitions, do's and don'ts, awamir and nawahi to do with the external body and the aqeedah, just like in the external category of external laws, we had commands like you have to offer salah and prohibitions like avoid zina. Likewise, we have laws to do with the heart. Laws to do with the heart. There are commands and prohibitions. Commands such as Allah says that we have to have ikhlas, sincerity. We have to, we have, to have tawakkul, reliance upon Allah. It's to do with the heart. Ikhlas is inside the heart. Nobody knows the inner part of the heart. You could be offering salah, I could be offering salah and just want to show someone that I'm offering salah. This is, it's ri'ah, which is the opposite of, of ikhlas. Showing off, ostentation. So the don'ts are the opposite of the do's. Ikhlas is a command. The prohibition is ri'ah, ostentation. The command is tawadu, humbleness and humility. The prohibition is, is the opposite, which is arrogance and pride. The command is uh, ikhlas, we said that, and uh, the, the command is ithar, giving preference to others and, and wanting good for others. The opposite of that is jealousy, hasad, which is, which is the prohibition, which is haram. We have tawakkul, reliance upon Allah, shukr, gratitude. These are all these very important laws, right? And I'll tell you one thing here that many of us sometimes we forget. Just as it is fard, these are fara'id, brothers and sisters. These are fara'id, these are obligations. These are obligations, just like we have obligations externally. There are obligations internally, but we live in a time where people sometimes forget to pay the necessary attention on the internal, because internal is hidden internal, nobody knows. External, we can, everyone can detect it and see that, whoa, this person is, mashallah, he offers salah, he comes to the masjid, he dresses like a Muslim, he keeps a beard, he's going hajj, he's going umrah. So we, you know, feel like doing them more. But the internal, because it's only you and Allah, me and Allah, we and Allah, and nobody else knows, ikhlas, nobody really knows. So we neglect these internal laws. And these internal laws are no different and rather, according to some scholars, even more important. Just like it is farda ayn to offer salah, farda ayn personally obligatory. Not fard kifaya. This is personally obligatory on every Muslim to fast in the month of Ramadan. It is personally obligatory, necessary, mandatory upon every Muslim to acquire ikhlas, to acquire in himself or herself the quality of tawakkul. Taqwa, the love of Allah, the love of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And avoid, just like it's haram, just like zina is haram, backbiting is unlawful, and just like um, usury and interest is prohibited and a major sin, just like murdering and killing someone is haram, likewise jealousy and uh, hatred and enmity and ingratitude towards Allah, all these are majorly haram. These are laws, and this third category, what is this third category known as? This third category, what is it known as? Somebody? Some people are saying tasawwuf. What is this third category? It doesn't matter what you call it. You want to call it green, call it green. Inshallah, brothers, if you can come move ahead a bit, inshallah. Whatever you want to call this category, it's not a problem. You know the Arabs, they have this saying, this is a saying, لا مشاحة في الاصطلاح There's no problem, don't get too worried with names and terms. It's the concept that matters. You, you, you can do zina and name it nikah, it's not going to become nikah, it's going to remain zina. Right? You can say it's business, I take a loan from you and then I'll say, okay, you tell me, okay, it's a loan. 
and then I'll say, okay, you pay me a loan back, I'll take 100, and you say to me, pay me 110 back, I said, okay, I'll pay you 110 back, I'll give you 110 as a loan. And we ask, someone asks us, what's happened? He said, I gave him 100 pounds loan, and he's going to give me 110 pounds loan back. He said, there's interest. No, no, I give him a loan, he's saying, are you giving me interest alone? No, I give you loan. Is he alone? It's interest. Consideration is given to the concept, not the term. Terms don't matter. You know, we sometimes get too much bogged down with these terms. Just like the first category known as aqeedah, ilm al-tawheed, ilm al-kalam, whatever, you know, category, whatever term was used, the ulama used different terms. Likewise, a second category, you know, the second category, different terms were used, but mainly it was fiqh. Another term was used, which was Islam, right? Some of the ulama. This third category, some people, they like to use the term tasawwuf, Sufism, but it's, it's not necessary. If somebody doesn't want to use that, not a problem whatsoever. There is no need. There is no need to use it. You don't become less of a Muslim if you don't use it. You don't become less of a spiritual individual if you don't use it. But neither is it wrong or haram or bid'ah or shirk or something wrong if you start using it. It doesn't mean if it was not used in the time of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then you can't use it otherwise. You can't use anything. What's this masjid called? Forest Gate Masjid. Do you have another name? Imam Zakaria. Was there a masjid in the time of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called Imam Zakaria? No. You, like for, you have different categories. You know, there's another, you have another science called the science of Nah, the science of Sarf, Arabic grammar, syntax. It's become a category, a science. Usul al fiqh. It's a category. Mustalah usul al hadith. The science where you look into research into the hadith, whether they are sahih, whether they are hasan, whether they are da'if, or whether they are fabricated, mawdu or not. And you look at the mutawatir and the mashhur and the aziz and the gharib and the mursal and the numerous types of hadith. Was there any categorization in the time of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sahaba? This is a sahih hadith, this is a da'if hadith. Come on, you'll know, you'll ask the Messenger of Allah, you know, he's speaking himself. Who made these classifications, categorizations later on? It was the scholars in the, actually very late on, in the 5th, 6th century. There's a definition given for a hadith, which is sahih. There's actually a definition. A sahih hadith is a, is a hadith which comes to us. There's five conditions. There's ittasalu sanan, the chain is transmitted, it's connected. Adalatu rawi every single narration is, uh, sorry, narrator is upright. Al-dabit, dabtu rawi every single narrator it has the quality of preservation and good memory. And then you have Adam al-Shudud, which is not, not having isolation. I mean, this is not time to elaborate, but and you, you, it doesn't have illat al qadiha a defect. Now, did the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam make this definition and make, put these five conditions? Did the Sahaba, there was no such a thing. If, if, you, if you were in the time of the Sahaba, Hadith, Sahih, Hassan, what is all that? Nobody knows. There is no, de- is there a definition mentioned anywhere in the Quran and Hadith? Is there any definition of what a Sahih Hadith is? Later on, scholars, they made this definition. This, they made this definition. I remember, I mean, this is off topic, but I remember this incident once. There was a scholar, a huge scholar, actually one of the scholars that I took Ijazah from in the subcontinent. He went to Haram. He's passed away, rahimahullah. He passed away like 10 years ago in 1996. He was in his 90s. He went to Haram in Mecca once and he, somebody came to me and said, I want to debate with you. Now, he says, look, I don't do these debates. And debates, don't do debates, brothers and sisters. It's not a time to do debates. But he says, I want to talk to you about an issue of fiqh. He had a problem with him about some issue about how to pray salah, whether you should raise your hands or not raise your hands or whatever, all these small petty issues. Anyway, so the scholar said, look, I don't you know, like debating. If you want to know something or a particular something, I'll tell you, inshallah, whatever knowledge I have. He says, no, I want to discuss this particular issue of salah. It was maybe, I don't know what it was, maybe about Amin, loudly, something, which really you don't need to discuss. I mean, there's hadiths dealing with all these issues and you have numerous types of hadiths of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam indicating different things. But he said, look, I want to have a debate with you and I want to discuss this particular issue. And he was a follower of one of the schools of the four schools of thought. And he said, look, but in your school, I think, you know, your evidences are all weak and that's why I want to have a proper debate and I want to discuss these issues in light of the Quran and Sunnah. He said, okay, let's talk, inshallah, not debate, well, let's talk. So the brother said, before we carry on, I have a condition. So what's your condition? He said, my condition is that we will discuss this matter of salah, of fiqh, in light of only verses of the Quran and 
absolutely rigorously authenticated hadith uh, sahih that's it i don't want to know about any other proof you're going to bring from anywhere else that this imam said this and that imam said this proof in light of quran and sunnah which is great alhamdulillah but not even just normal he said that your evidence is we will only discuss in light of quran and hadith sahih that's it nothing else you understand my point so the shaykh said, okay, no problem, no problem, we'll talk, we'll just be verses of the Qur'an or rigorously authenticated hadith sahih, whether, whether they are in Sahih al-Bukhari or Sahih Muslim or Sunan of Imam Tirmidhi or the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, wherever they are, but al-Hadith is sahih. Then he said, okay, before we carry on, then the shaykh said, look, I have a condition as well. No, sorry, he never said I had a condition. He said, okay, before we carry on, he said, I want to ask you something. He said, what's that? He said, can you define me a hadith sahih? What is the definition? He said, this every child knows. Well, every student of knowledge who studies those five conditions. He said, are you trying to test me? He said, no, no, I'm not trying to test you. I know you studied and you studied and you have a lot of knowledge of Islam and everything. But the only point here is that so that we are on the same wavelength and we both speak the same language. Let's just, you know, just tell me the brief definition of hadith sahih you know whatever you know so i know that you have the same understanding of hadith sahih in your mind as i have so the brother started saying of course it's easy simple who doesn't know sahih? the five conditions hadith sahih the definition is that this the, when he started he said wait, wait 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 before you carry on i have a condition as well just like your condition i have a condition and my condition is no different to your condition my condition is give me a definition of hadith sahih in light of a quran verse or a hadith sahih you said, don't tell me, who made these conditions up? It was made in the 5th century. I don't want to, don't tell me this Imam made this. Tell me, there's a verse of Surah Al-Baqarah or Fatiha. Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim, Ya, Yuhal, Ladina, Amanu, O, You, Believe. There's Khamsa, Shurud, Five Conditions of Hadith Sahih. Is there a verse like that? Imam, read in Salah. Is there anywhere in the Quran? Or tell me a Hadith. There's a Hadith that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, there's five conditions. A Hadith Sahih is like this and a Hassan one is like this. You have to go back and say this Imam and these Imams and these scholars are the ones who made these conditions. Right? So the point here, this was besides the point. What I'm trying to say that not anything that was not mentioned by the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or the term used becomes a bid'ah or wrong or sinful. So somebody wants to use tasawwuf Sufism, not a problem. And you know the word tasawwuf which is an Arabic term, it was used later on. Nobody used it in the time of the Sahaba, right? Nobody used it in the time of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And nobody has to use it. I personally, I tell you, me personally, this is just a personal inclination. I personally don't like to use the term. Seriously, this is my personal inclination. The better term that I like to use is just a personal preference. Tazkiyatul Qalb is in the Quran, purification of the heart. Tazkiyah is, is a word which is in the Quran. Qalb, which is in the Quran. But somebody wants to use the term tasawwuf. Some of the ulama said, why did, how did this term become so uh, renowned? They actually looked into the root word. Some said it's from the word suf, which means wool. That, you know, some of these scholars who were, or some of these Muslims who were dedicating their life to spirituality, they used to go into the, like, uh, uh, in the deserts, uh, and they used to just wear wool and things like that. That's why they became known as Sufis. Some said it's from the word sifa, because sifa means a character trait. What did we say? This last category of laws are those in which, what is the last category? We said commands and prohibitions, in which a Muslim has to avoid all the prohibitions. And these prohibitions are known as blameworthy character traits, known as a radha'il in Arabic. We have what? The singular is a radhilatun. The plural is radha'il, blameworthy character traits. And what's necessary is to replace them with fadila and fadail, which are the praiseworthy character traits. So these are character traits. Traits, qualities, attributes is also known in Arabic as sifa. Those of you or some of you who know Arabic, the word sifa in Arabic means an attribute. So if somebody has an attribute of ikhlas, an attribute of tawakkul, an attribute of giving preference to others, then that person, because he has a sifa, he is Sufi, the one with the attribute. Right? 
and there's some other reasons, but it's just, it doesn't matter whatever the term they used. So this, this category was known as the science of the sawwuf. And actually there's a definition, huwa ilmun yu'arafu bihi, yu'arafu bihi anwa'u al-fadaili wa kayfiyyatu ittisabiha. Wa yu'arafu bihi anwa'u al-radaili wa kayfiyyatu ittisabiha. It's a topic, it's a category, it's a science in which a person learns the various praiseworthy attributes and character traits and how to acquire them and achieve them and implement them in his life and it's a science in which a person learns about the blameworthy character traits the radail and how to avoid them some some people use the term this third category also known as ilmul akhlaq and that's why we said akhlaq as well one of the terms used also tazkiyatul qalb i just mentioned that which i personally like to use more than tasawwuf you can call it wherever you want and there's actually a, another term which is a term of the hadith which is actually very good ihsan ihsan and this is taken from the famous hadith of jibrail and this is why i said implicitly this three category classification is based implicitly on this famous hadith of the messenger of allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam you all know or most of you will know the famous hadith which is in the sahih of al-bukhari and elsewhere Sayyiduna Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, he says, We were sitting بينما نحن جلوس مع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. We were sat in the company of the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم. إذ طلع علينا رجل. Suddenly a man arrived in the masjid. شديد بياض الثياب. Extremely white clothing. شديد بياض سواد الشعب. Extremely black hair. لا يرى عليه أثر السفر. ولا يعرفه منا أحد. The Sahaba, this Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab, he says, it was quite ironic and intriguing and funny because amazing. Reason being was that nobody recognized him, yet he had no effects of travel on him. Medina was small, everybody knew everybody. Right? Not to become nosy, but they knew everybody to help. In our communities, we, we know everything, what's the neighbor doing, what's people in the next, everyone in our communities, because we are nosy. Mm, do you know they've got marriage problems? Do you know that person, they're doing this? Do you know their business? You know, they're working there, they're making their money, they're making, did you see that some things came? You know how they're earning? Do you know they get benefits? They're doing this all day long, riba, riba, riba. Anyway, but that's another topic. Muslims are supposed to know one another to help. And if they don't need help, then mind your own business. Being nosy in Islam is actually haram. It's actually a sinful activity. وَلَا تَجَسَّسُ It's in the Quran, Surah Al-Hujurat. Allah says, don't become a jasus, a nosy individual. Don't go, go and investigate and spy on people. It's a haram activity. But they used to know people because to help one another. Right? So, he said, nobody recognized him. So, which means that he must have come from somewhere from outside of Medina. But... He had no effects of travel on him. His clothes were white. And as you know, they never used to travel in trains or the underground tube network or on the bus or in the car or in a 4x4 uh, four four or a you know, really nice BMW that they can keep their clothes nice and neat and clean. Even in, nowadays, we can't keep them. You know, you, especially with wearing jubbas and long thobes, you, know, you iron them and, and they get creased. You just sit in these cars. But... No effect of travel. So it was quite amazing and intriguing. And then he said he came to the... You know this hadith. I'm not going to go into the details of the hadith. But he came to the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And he asked three questions. Well, he asked many questions. But three of the questions that I want to just out, uh, uh, mention to you here. Mal iman, mal islam, mal ihsan. What did he say? What is iman? He said to the messenger, he asked the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what is Iman? So the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responded by saying what? أَن تُؤْمِنَ بِاللَّهِ وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ وَكُتُبِهِ وَرُسُولِهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَالْقَدْرِ خَيْرِهِ وَشَرِّهِ What is Iman? This is the first category. The first category Iman, that you believe in Allah, you believe in the messenger of Allah, you believe in the final day, you believe in life after death, you believe in destiny, qadr, whether it's good or bad. All of this is to do with which category? The first category. Therefore, the first category, you can also term it as Iman. Like you term it as uh, Aqeedah, Islamic creed, you can term it as Iman. Second question was Mal Islam. What is Islam? 
He said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, أَن تُقِيمَ الصَّلَةِ وَتُؤْتِيَ الزَّكَاةِ وَتَصُومَ رَمَضَانِ وَتَحُجِّ الْبَيْتِ إِنْ إِسْتَطَعْتَ إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلًا That you offer your salah. Salah is to do with external or internal. It's external, yeah, activity. And you, offer, you, you give your zakat, you pay your zakat. What zakat? To do with the heart? Can your heart pay the zakat? Like some people actually do that. My heart is paying the zakat. No, seriously, one brother actually said, he said, you know, I feel very spiritual. Zakat is all from, you know, spirituality, tazkiyah. So, you know, I have, you know, my heart, inshallah, I feel, you know, I have a lot of concern and feeling for the Muslim ummah. So this is my zakat from my heart. Zakat is external or internal? It's external. Hajj. Some people do hajj with the heart as well. You know, I, they do it in the dreams. You know, they go Haram and Mecca and they dream about Hajj and it's done. We live in, I'm going to talk about some of these issues later on as well. Because there is another side to Tasawwuf as well, which is very important. And unfortunately, we live in a time where there's extremism in most of the things that we see today with Islam, connected to Islam. Khairul Umuri Awsatuha, the best of ways is the middle way. Khairul Umuri Awsatuha, we have to always remember. So, there's an extreme as well uh, approach to the whole issue of Tasawwuf, which we need to discuss as well. But, um, Islam, he, he mentioned all these external laws. And then he said, Mal Ihsan, what is Ihsan? This is a high level maqam and status. It's to do with the heart. And ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tarahu. Worship Allah with your heart. That you are, as you are seeing Him, you can't see Allah, but it's from the heart. That's why, you know, the reward for the people who have Ihsan, Allah says in the Quran, لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُوا الْحُسْنَ وَزِيَادَةٌ Those people, Ahsanu, who have the quality of Ihsan in this life, their reward is Al-Husna, which is paradise, as explained by the commentators of the Quran. They'll receive good, وَزِيَادَةٌ an extra. You know what that extra is? Anybody know what's that extra? The commentators of the Quran, the Mufassirun, they say the extra ziyadatun, this is unanimously agreed, is the vision and the sight of Allah in the next life. <laughs> imam Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali, rahimahullah, a great Imam, and hanbali Imam, he explains, he says, you know why this reward is given for Ihsan? Because in the dunya, the man of Ihsan was seeing Allah with his heart, so the reward is in the next life seeing Allah with the eyes. This is why this is so appropriate. This reward of seeing Allah for the people of Ihsan. Because the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ihsan is an ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tarah. This is the response he gave. An ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tarah. That you worship Allah as though you are seeing Him. فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاكُ If you cannot reach that level, that position, that maqam, that status, that you are seeing Allah with your heart, then know that at least you know this much that Allah is seeing you. So worshipping Allah with full khushu, with ikhlas and sincerity, with the heart, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam described that with ihsan. So this is also a term used. These are three different categories. If you look in the Quran, these three laws connected to these three categories, sometimes they're mentioned together and sometimes on different places. Like different places, you'll find the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah, you might see something to do with aqidah. And Surah Al-Hujarat, you'll see something to do with uh, uh, the, the fiqh aspect, the external laws. And you might find another verse to do with the internal laws. But sometimes Allah talks about in one surah, famous surah, Surah Al-Asr. Surah Al-Asr, in two lines, Allah gives us examples of four actions which deal with all three categories. Wal-Asr, by time. Inna l-insana lafi khusr. Verily, mankind is in loss. What does Allah say after that? إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Except those people who believe Iman. Category number one. وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصُوا بِالْحَقِّ They do أعمال الصالحة. External actions. And they uh, advise one another, counsel one another of haq, which is to do with the mouth. You're doing it externally. So it's from the second category. And then he says, وَتَوَاصُوا the sabr, patience, is to do with the inner self, the heart and the soul. In one surah, Allah gave us examples of laws, of injunctions, which deal with all three categories. So these are three categories. And this third category can be known as ihsan or tasawwuf or tasqiyatul qalb. From this explanation, you understand, brothers and sisters, that 
Tazkiyatul qalb Purification of the heart Purification of the soul Tasawwuf, Ihsan, Sufism Whatever you want to call it Whatever you want to term it is, Has got nothing to do with the other than Quran and Sunnah It's to do everything to do with the Quran and Sunnah It's from the central teachings of the Quran and Sunnah And this is something that nobody disagrees upon And this is really what Sufism is Everything else is extra, it's on the side. This is the main objective. This is what we need to understand. What is the main objective, purpose, aim, goal? We live in a time today, there are so many differences, so many problems, disputes. You know what? I'll tell you one thing. Most of our differences are issues that are not even important. You know, if you see, if you take a package of tasawwuf, Sufism, the main objective is purification of the heart of the soul, 80%. 20%, some extra things here and there that help. Some agree, some disagree. You can carry on agreeing and disagreeing until you, you, know, you leave this world. You'll never come to a conclusion. But the 80%, the main heart, everybody agrees upon. And that's really what tasawwuf is about. And that is the real central obligation of tasawwuf. It's to do with the heart. Tazkiyatul qalb, purification of the heart. There are numerous verses and hadith that talk about purification of the heart. One of the objectives of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, coming to this world, Allah mentions this in the Quran, He says, It is Allah who sent a messenger from amongst them, from the humans. And what is his job description? What are the objectives, primary objectives of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He said, there are four primary objectives of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He recites the book on them, the Quran. He teaches, he taught the Sahaba, the Sahaba taught their followers, the book of Allah. He teaches them, uh, and then he, he teaches them how to recite the book, and then he teaches them the meanings of the book. Second job description. This is the reason why Allah sent the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And then يُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْحِكْمَةِ He teaches them wisdom which comes through his sunnah And then he said وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ He teaches them how to spiritually purify them from the diseases of the heart This is in the Quran قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ ذَكَّاهَ وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَ The one who purified his soul his heart he has indeed achieved success and salvation falah and the one who corrupted his soul has indeed become become a loser khaba he is he is in loss he is in a loss yawma la yanfa'malu wala banun allah tells us in another place on the day of judgment nothing will be of benefit nothing mal wala banun no wealth no money no children on the day of judgment, Allah says, "Illa man biqalbin salim." Only that person will be in benefit is the one who comes to Allah with a qalbun salim. Salim, in Arabic, means sound, purified. Someone who comes to Allah with a sound heart, and this is an obligation. We today, brothers and sisters, we all day long argue about issues that are not going to benefit us at all in the least and the central obligation we overlook it there is no benefit there are people arguing about peripheral issues to do with the sawuf and the same people when they argue they neglect all the laws connected to the tazkiyatul qalb there's jealousy there's hatred there's enmity there's pride there's arrogance me we our group this group that group the whole reason why the sawwuf was prescribed was to purify the heart and the soul. That's the central obligation. It's part and parcel of the teachings of Islam. There is no other objective. Everything else is a means to this objective. Everything else. Everything else is... Some people, they think the sawwuf spirituality has to do with... The objective is not to, you know, it's, it's not to see dreams. If somebody wants to become a Sufi to see dreams, then you know, just keep seeing dreams in a different way. You don't need to become... It's nothing to do with seeing a dream. 
You might want, you might, Allah might bless you with a dream, fine. It's got nothing to do with seeing dreams. You don't have some spiritual healing powers. It's got nothing to do with amulets. It's got nothing to do with that. You don't, someone doesn't become a Sufi to start healing and doing this and having miracles. You can't, Allah can bless somebody with a miracle. Not a problem. Mu'ajaza is a miracle given to the prophets. Karama is a, is a miracle given to any Muslim. Allah can choose anybody. Any one of us can have a karama. It can happen. It might already have happened to you and you haven't probably even noticed. Sometimes you might think, oh, this was amazing, just so lucky. This is, which karama, you know karama, some people, again, you know what karama means in Arabic? Allah's honored you. That's it. No big deal. Allah's honored you. Allah honors people in different ways. That's what karama means. Karama. It's not some really, you know, hidden, some sacred holy word that it basically means Allah's honored you. Sometimes you see, Alhamdulillah, today, you know, I was just wishing this and this happened. How many times it happened to us? Any Muslim Allah can honor. So this can happen. It's not a problem. But the objective of the sawwuf is not karama. It's not some amulet. It's not spiritual healing powers. It's not to do with any of that. Even, you know, the different types of dhikr and people do, that's not the objective. Dhikr in itself is an objective, like Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu dhikru Allah dhikran kathira. But when some of the people connected to the sawwuf, they do certain types of dhikr, that's not the objective. It's not, it's not running around behind a spiritual guide, and that's not the objective. We unfortunately live in a time that the, these are all means. Means have become an objective and the objective is overlooked. The means, people think the Sawf is, I've got a Sheikh, I am a Sufi. Far from it. It's gonna, you, you, someone can be a Sufi without a Sheikh and someone can be a complete, totally opposite of being a Sufi and still have a Sheikh. It's not, that's not the objective. It's a means. It is a means to an objective. The main objective is this, what's mentioned in the Qur'an. يُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابُ وَالْحِكْمَةِ قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ ذَكَّاهَ And the hadith of Jibra'il, Ihsan, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what did he say? أَلَا إِنَّ فِي الْجَسَدِ مُدْغَ Beware, let it be known. فِي الْجَسَدِ مُدْغَ In the body there's a piece of flesh, there's a part, there's an organ. أَلَا إِنَّ فِي الْجَسَدِ مُدْغَ إِذَا صَلُحَتْ صَلُحَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّهُ وَإِذَا فَسَدَتْ فَسَدَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّهُ If that is sound, the whole body is sound. If that's corrupt, everything else becomes corrupt. He said, أَلَا وَهِيَ الْقَلْبِ Let it be known, it's the heart. This heart, you know we're talking about the heart? We're not talking about the physical heart. This is the spiritual heart we're talking about. It's the spiritual heart. You know, the, it's, not the, it's not the heart that uh, a surgeon, you have a heart surgery or a heart, uh, you know, bypass um, operation or whatever not not that heart it's the spiritual heart this is what allah is talking about it's an amazing part this is what's mentioned in the hadith and the ulama have actually discussed the differences and i don't have the time to go into the difference between the ruh and the heart and the aql and the qalb and the ruh the spirit books have been written on that fuad another term used for the heart but it's a spiritual heart which Allah has blessed every one of us. And even the spiritual heart is connected to the physical heart. Right? It is. And, and therefore, it's the spirituality of that heart which is on the, you know, the left-hand side of every human. And some of the early ulama they said everything we do in this life is to impact the heart. Even the non-Muslims know how important the heart is. Everything we do externally is connected to our heart. Even our expressions are based on our heart. You know, someone, he's a harsh-hearted person, warm-hearted person, cold-hearted individual. My heart skipped a beat. Yeah, it happens. This guy's got a heart like a rock. Some of the ulama said that even the reason why the Arabic language and Hebrew as well, it starts from the right, is even writing and reading the Quran, everything start from the right and it should impact the heart, it goes to the left. It's not a hadith, it's just some of the ulama, they, they, they see the wisdom. That everything in Islam, even reading the Quran, you're reading from the right, you go to the left and you're impacting the heart. It's the central part because the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, what did he say? He said, Allah inna fil jasadi mudga, if that heart is sound, 
everything else is sound. And if this is corrupt, everything else is corrupt. So this is the central objective. This is the central objective, maqsad, aim, purpose, and goal, which is tazkiyatul qalb, purification of the heart. And the opposite of that is having a diseased heart. A diseased heart. Adamu tazkiyatul qalb. The objective is to have a purified spiritual heart. And the objective is to acquire all the praiseworthy character traits one by one. Every single one of them. And remove. Well, before acquiring, you need to remove. If you have a wall that's really dirty, we need to first clean the wall. That's why the scholars, this is a term, this is a proverb or a saying. Some of the early scholars, they said, At-takhliya qabla tahliya. Takhliya means removing, emptying, cleaning. Tahliya is adorning. So if you've got all the diseases like pride and arrogance and hatred, remove all of them. First clean your heart, the wall of your heart. And then start adorning that heart with all the good praiseworthy character traits. But they go hand in hand. As soon as you remove the pride, instantly you'll get the... and you'll acquire the quality, the attribute, the praiseworthy character trait of tawadu and humbleness, humility. Now, just like all the other... just like the other two sciences, the first science of aqidah, no Muslim, nobody can learn the science of aqidah on their own, can they? No, nothing in this world. Can you become a doctor by yourself on your own? I'll learn English and I'll pick up, I'll go to the medical science department in the library. I'll read all the books on medical science. They're written in English, they're not in Chinese. I know English. I'm a professor of the English language. I'll read the books in, on the topic of medical science. Can I become a doctor? No, no government, no one will allow me. I'll be playing with people's lives. Can you become a practicing barrister lawyer just by reading the books on law? No, let alone all these complicated uh, subjects and sciences the basic art of cooking as well nobody can cook by just reading the ingredients in those ingredients books try it especially if you're a husband man you've never cooked in your life try it <laughs> get those Indian delights you know those Indian delights oh I don't know some people have maybe Bangladeshi delights but there's a book they, they have these books try it and you'll see for yourself what you what you make nobody can every woman who learns how to cook, learns how to cook by her mother, or an auntie, or a grandmother. A qualified chef becomes, you know these programs they have on, on cooking and all of that. People learn even the basic art of cooking. That's how Allah has created us. Every science we need teachers. The science of Aqidah, we need a teacher. It became a topic, you know the science of Aqidah. In the time of the Messenger wasallam, there was no science of Aqidah. Later on it became a science, a topic, a subject. Books were written. I told you Imam at tahawi wrote a book. Imam Ghazali wrote books. And many other scholars wrote books on the science of Aqidah. It became a science. You need a teacher to teach you Aqidah. Otherwise, you, people will be deviated. Likewise, a second category. Fiqh. The laws of the external laws. Salah, zakat, hajj, fasting, business, trade, marriage, divorce, inheritance. All of these things, they require a teacher. It became a science. That's where we have these four schools of thought that came into existence because it became a science and more and more issues came into existence. Scholars, just like some ulama, they devoted their life to the first category. Some scholars dedicated their life to the second category. They are known as fuqaha. A faqih is a jurist or a mufti or a jurist or a faqih. Someone who is a special, who has a specialization in this external laws. Likewise, you have people who are specialized in the first category. And you need teachers. Likewise, the third category of laws. You need a teacher. Seriously, you need a teacher. Somebody might think, why do I need it? I mean, who needs to tell me that I, uh, you know, this is pride? or who, Do I need to learn? Of course. First and foremost, no one will think they've got pride if they've got pride. You need someone else to tell you. That's for starters. If I have pride, will I ever think a proud person is proud anyway? Is he going to think he's proud? Imagine a proud person, an arrogant individual. He's arrogant anyway. Of course not. I don't, I don't have pride. I'm not arrogant. You think I have pride? Of course not. You, for a starter, you need someone else to tell you. These are internal, hidden. There is more of a need of a teacher to detect and to help you. 
You might you might make your wife your sheikh, make you know tell her to detect you, no problem. But you need someone, at least, just tell your husband. You know, you know look every time if if you think I've got a spiritual disease like pride or arrogance or too much love of the dunya, you know, yeah, that's really good. You know, if your wife makes you your sheikh, every time she wants to buy a handbag or shoes, she's like love of dunya. You can't buy this, you've got too much love of the world. Right? But you can, you need someone. And then that someone, you, you're not going to make shaitan that person because he won't tell you. you right? So for, you'll definitely make someone who's a Muslim. You're not going to tell some non-Muslim kafir, tell you, you know what, you know, can you tell me you know, about my spiritual diseases? And, you know, of course not. Who, what does he know? Are you going to tell any Muslim? So you, now you need a Muslim. Are you going to tell someone who's pubbing and clubbing, you know what, I want you to tell me who, what are my spiritual diseases? Of course not. You want a practicing Muslim. Then do you want a practicing Muslim who doesn't have no knowledge of Islam, just some random practicing individual? No, you want the best. Which means that you will look for someone who himself is a very spiritual person who's actually worked on his heart. He's gone through the process. He knows the ins and outs. You want to buy a car, you won't go to the grocery man. You'll go to the mechanic. Right? You, if you want to buy... Uh, grocery you won't go to the mechanic you go to the expert this person knows the industry he knows the industry he knows the area he knows the field and also he has knowledge of Islam he's a scholar very important condition you can't have jahils absolute ignorant people to start telling others because ilm is a prerequisite knowledge is a prerequisite for anyone being a spiritual guide Ilm is definitely necessary. I'm not saying you have to be a, like someone who studied eight years, nine years, whatever. But knowledge of Islam is a must. Knowledge of Islam. Without you can't be. That's why, uh, you know, Imam Shafi'i radiallahu anhu, he said in one of his poetry, Imam Shafi'i used the word Sufi. You know Imam Shafi'i? One of the great Imams of this Ummah. He, has, he was a poet as well. He has a book called Diwan. Diwan on Imam Shafi'i. He said in there, Faqihan wa Sufiyan, Fakun laysa wahidan. فَإِنِّي بِحَقِّ اللَّهِ إِيَّاكَ لَأَنْسَحُ فَذَلِكَ قَاسٍ لَمْ يَذُقْ قَلْبُهُ تُقًا وَهَذَا جَهُولٌ فَكَيْفَ ذُو الْجَهْلِ يَصْلَحُ He said, فَقِيهًا وَسُوفِيًّا فَكُنْ لَيْسَ وَاحِدًا Don't be just a faqih and don't be just a sufi. In other words, don't be a man of just the second category and don't be a man just of the third category. Don't be someone who just deals with external laws and just acts upon Islam without knowledge and don't be just be a spiritual individual who thinks you know what I am a very spiritual individual but has no knowledge of Islam don't be one of the two be both at the same time have knowledge as well as spirituality he said you know why he said by Allah I give you sincere counsel he said the former one that one the first one which one what did he say first? Faqih or Sufi? Faqih, the former one, the one who knows all the dry laws of Islam. He is Qasin, he has a hard heart. Qaswa. Lam yadhuq qalbuhu tuqan. He has never tasted taqwa and the love of Allah in his heart. He knows all the laws, halal, haram, halal, haram. Is this allowed? Allowed, not allowed. It's all about dry laws. This is allowed, this is not allowed. Like this, like that. How was it? How's a cow? Allah says, you know, what kind of cow this is just dry information and then he said the other the latter one the Sufi who doesn't have the knowledge and this guy is an ignorant individual how can a person of ignorance be a person of salah of piety of righteousness and how can he guide others for some people if you feel good that's Islam remember Islam is not about feeling good Islam is about waking up in the morning when you have to wake up for Salatul Fajr and it's difficult. It's not about feeling good. Actually the hadith says Hujibatil Jannah to Bil Makari. Entering Jannah is veiled by difficult things. It's not about how you feel. Otherwise people will start saying, you know what, I get a buzz in a nightclub as well. <laughs> yeah, people sometimes they can go to that extent. It's not about how we feel. You can't prove anything how you feel. It's not about the feeling. It's about first and foremost what's allowed and what's not allowed. It's based on the laws. And then after that, you can do whatever you want if it's legitimate. So anyway, uh, this is what Imam Shafi'i radiallahu anhu he said. He said, so I was saying, you need a teacher. You need someone to detect. This is a science. 
tasawwuf ihsan was a science that was taught is still taught books were written just like you have a course on the fiqh of salah course on the fiqh of pride and arrogance on the laws of pride and arrogance we should have courses this is why why because we live in a time we'll do courses on marriage on divorce on business transactions on aqeedah one day course on the laws of pride and arrogance and humility we need to learn because there are things to learn about i tell you i'll give you an example you might say what do you need to learn? pride i mean is this rocket science what do you need to learn about you know i'll give you just an example there's something called kibr it's which is pride and arrogance and there's something else called izzatun nafs self-respect or tahdith bin ni'mah Allah says in the Quran in Surah Wadduha, Wa Amma Biniamati Rabbika fa hadith. If Allah blesses you with a ni'mah, say it. In the hadith of Al Bukhari, in Allah Yuhibu and Yura Athar in Ni'amihi ala ibadi. Allah loves to see his the effect of his ni'mah bounty on his slave. Allah likes dress well, look good, you know, have respect about your own self. Okay? This is Izzatun Nafs. Have your own respect. Don't be a foolish individual and don't joke to an extent in the community that people lose respect for you. This is actually wrong. There are levels and there are limits for everything. That's why to preserve self-respect, that doesn't mean you become aggressive and pride. And now this is, this, is the, this is the issue. There's a fine line. Where is it izzatun nafs? And then where does it go? It's borderline. It's going into pride and arrogance. It's something you need to learn about. Someone else will tell you. Someone who's qualified and somebody who's a spiritual individual, he will tell you. Now look, you know what? You're crossing the, the border here. You're crossing the limit. Until now you had self-respect and now you've trespassed. You've gone into the uh, category of pride and arrogance. Move back a step. This is, this is the difference. You have to learn this is an issue. This is one issue. Likewise, tawadu. Humbleness, humility is required. Allah said in the hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what did he say? Man tawada alillah rafa'ahu Allah. The one who is humble and has humility, Allah will elevate him. Now, tawadu is required from us, but at the same time, to degrade oneself to an extent that everybody loses respect for you and you, you don't even respect your own self, that's actually sinful and wrong. It's wrong. To say, you know, I'm, to be, I'm so humble and that's it, you know, everybody walk over me and, you know, that's it, hit me on the head and, and pull my hair and I'm just, you know, that's actually sinful. We are not required by Islam to be as humble to the next extent that we lose our respect totally in the community. Now, when is it tawadu? When is it dhillatun nafs? Degrading one's own self. Are you really, you thinking you might be humble, but you might be degrading yourself? And you might be degrading yourself thinking it's tawadu. These are things to learn. These are just two examples I've given. These are, and then I told you, I mentioned that, look, we need someone else to tell us. So this is where in the science of tasawwuf and spirituality, we need someone, a teacher, a guide. You, and now here again, don't worry about terms. You want to call him, you know, you know, the clock, call him the clock. Don't call him the clock. You, some people say, what's this beer or what? It doesn't matter. Call him beer then. Change, change the, you know, and whatever you want to call. Call him my teacher. No problem. These are just terms. Spiritual guide. Some people like to use the term sheikh. Sheikh literally means an old man. Linguistically, literally, sheikh means an old man. That's what it means. Really, if you look, you look in the dictionary, sheikh means an old man. It's in the Quran. Allah uses it in that sense. Call him Shaykh, a Murshid, Murshid is from the word Arshada Yurshidu Irshadan in Arabic, which means to guide someone. Murshid means to guide someone. Alright? It means to guide someone. And uh, so you can use the Murshid as well. <laughs> you know, there was this, I just remembered something. One of my friends is from the Arab world. Uh, I think. Uh, he, uh, I think it's from Morocco. He was one saying that in the Arab world, you know, you know these navigations that you have. You know these navigations, tom toms. Everybody has them now on the phone. He said, I said, what, what do you call them in Arabic? In the Arab, I mean, in Arabic, it's a new. 
uh, item or, or, or some a new thing. What do you call it in Arabic? He said, well, it depends who you are. If you're a Salafi, you call it Dalil. Dalil, indicate, indicating. If you're a Sufi, you call it Murshid, guide. Anyway, I don't know if you understood that joke or not. But anyway. <laughs> um, Murshid means a guide. You want to call him Shaykh or Murshid or whatever. Teacher. Now this teacher doesn't become your God. This teacher, just like you want someone to teach you the rules of Salah, does it become your God? Does it become a prophet? Does it become a messenger? Is he a prophet of Allah? No, he's teaching you the rules of Salah. Is he some supernatural individual that has existed and come from Pluto or the Mars? He's a human being. No, he's as normal as you. He is just a human being. He has more knowledge than you maybe of Islam. Maybe more pious and righteous than you. So that's why he's helping you. And we don't exaggerate. People should not exaggerate in their venerance of their teachers. We should, we should definitely have respect for anything connected to Islam. Whether it's Allah, His Messenger, the Quran, the House of Allah, you know, we should respect anything, the books, the Quran, everything and anything related to Allah. A small child who has memorized the verse of the Quran, we respect him because he has the words of Allah in his heart. Anything. I mean, this, this is in the hadith. There's a hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Laysa minna man lam yarham saghirana, wa lam yuwaqqir kabirana, wa lam ya'rif li'alimina haqqah. It's a sound, sound authenticated, sahih hadith. The one, I think it's in the Musnad of Imam Ahmed, but I'm not too sure I can check the, the reference out for you later on if somebody needs the reference. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the one who does not respect our elders, parents and aunts and uncles and grandparents, and generally our elderly people, anyone older than you in age, the one who does not respect the elderly, and does not show compassion and mercy to the young ones. And the one who does not <coughs> recognize the right of our scholars is not from us. This is a sound hadith. I'm not saying this that because you start respecting me, because I'm not a scholar, by the way. I'm just a student. But this is a hadith of the Messenger. Sallallahu <laughs> Imagine. So you respect him. Of course you will respect him. This is not veneration to an extent that you make him a god or anything like that. He is not a supernatural human being. He is a slave of Allah. He is a pious, righteous, knowledgeable individual who is helping you like you have a teacher. And actually, this happens in the Arab world. You know, I used to meet friends down in the Arab world. They would use the term Shaykh for different. They used to have different Shaykhs. Like I said to one, this, you know, one of my friends, I said to him, who is your Shaykh? He said, well, if you're asking me, Shaykh huna fil fiqhi is such and such. My Shaykh in fiqh is such and such. My Shaykh in hadith is such and such. My Shaykh in nah is such and such in grammar. My Shaykh in uh, spirituality tasawwuf is such and such. Not a problem. It's just different teachers. And that's why sometimes another extreme we find in some of us is that one person, everything, that's it. Nobody, nobody else counts at all. That's also a bit of extremism. It has to be said. You know, that's it. Nobody else exists in the world. And that's it. And you don't respect anybody else. I'm going to mention some of those things. But the point here, I just want to finish this point. So, there's nothing. Is there any objection of having a spiritual guide or a sheikh? It's just a teacher. Then the question might come, finally. The, 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 the last question in this sequence. Is that, um, what is this? Because you see, normally, the, the objective is spiritually purifying yourself. And it's difficult to do that on your own, so you need a teacher. What is this thing called bay'ah? You know, people ask, pledge. First and foremost, that's a completely peripheral issue. You could live a life and not know what that is. You could be a person entering Jannah. You don't even need to know. It's a, such a peripheral issue on the side. It's not even this. This is not the, as I am explaining continuously. It's not the central obligation or the central essence of tasawwuf. But we don't know that. We think tasawwuf, Shaykh Bay'ah, straight away. Seriously, this is what we think. It's got nothing to do with the central essence of tasawwuf and Sufism and Ihsan and Tazkit al-Qalb. It's something on the side. 
to the point that there are scholars today today who are masters in the science of the skirt of qalb and ihsan who don't who, who say you know what this, this is just a side issue like i know one sheikh uh, somebody asked him i want to give pledge to you and do bay'ah with you on, in the science of tasawwuf he said you know what we'll do that i don't have time right now i don't know we'll see but start the work job this is not about just you know getting part of a cult or a group and my crew and it's not a cult this is not a cult business this is a work you have to do and also then he said that look this does not mean that as soon as you give bay'ah that's it you're somehow blessed and that's it it's effort the effort is on the individual of course the sheikh can make dua for you no problem you know inshallah you stay in the company of right people good people it's in the quran ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu taqullaha wa kunu ma'as sadiqin oh you who believe fear allah remain in the company of the righteous pious uh, there's numerous the sahaba were called sahaba because they remain in the suhba companionship of the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam al mar'u ala dini akhihi the hadith says a man is on the deen of his brother and I mean, we know this, that we, we, we influence one another. So staying in his company, you might be affected. You might be affected from the shaykh because you stayed in his company. You might be affected because maybe he's taught you something. You might be influenced and you might come onto the right path because you see his ways. You see him, oh, the way somebody came to speak to him and the way he responded out of absolute tawa, the humility you're learning from his individual action, how he implements the sunnah. But he's not going to just touch you on your face or your heart and that's it supernaturally you are completely transformed that's it you're done forever that that's not the objective of the soul you have to work hard bay'ah is not the end it's just the beginning and i'll tell you there's evidences on the bay'ah as well it's just the beginning in other words it's just a pledge it's just a pledge you know what it is it's a promise and do you know what a promise means it's like basically you have a teacher and a student, when a student goes into a madrasa, what does he do? He makes a pledge that, you know what, I will constantly come to the madrasa. You go, many of you are attending universities, you sign on the forms, I will not skive, I will not break the laws, I will not violate the laws, I will not go against the ethos and the principles of this university. You, take, you go to another country, you have a visa on your passport, what is that? I will obey the laws of the land. So basically, you're doing a bay'ah pledge to a shaykh. It's just a promise. You don't have to put your hands. You can touch his head if you want to, or you can just say it verbally. There's no specific way. Seriously, it's just a pledge. That look, both. It's both party pledges. It's a mutual pledge. The Sheikh is saying that, inshallah, I am taking on this job now. This is I am promising you that from my precious time that I need to spend for my with my own family, my wife, my children, my work, my home, my hundred and other activities and duties. From there, I promise you, I don't want to deceive you, that I'll tell you that, you know what, I'll help you, and then every time you want to see me, that I don't have time for you. I am taking on this responsibility. I promise you, as an individual, that anything, any guide you want, inshallah, I will help you. And he's saying that I will implement all the laws, and everything you teach me, I will implement. And this is the objective of the sawwuf. And this is what it is, this is what the sawwuf is. And bay'ah itself is not fard, it's not wajib. Maybe you can say the most is sunnah, there's evidences. Like in the Quran, Allah said that female companions would come to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. إِذَا جَاءَكَ الْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يُبَايِعْنَكَ عَلَىٰ أَلَّا يُشْرِكْنَ بِاللَّهِ شَيْئًا وَلَا يَسْرِقْنَ وَلَا يَزْنِينَ وَلَا يَقْتُلْنَ أُولَادَهُنَّ وَلَا يَأْتِينَ بِبُهْتَانٍ يَفْتَرِينَهُ بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِنَّ وَأَرْجُلِهِنَّ That, O oh Messenger of Allah, when these females, women come to you to give their pledge, and they come to pledge that they will not associate partners with Allah. This was not the pledge of Islam. They were already Muslims. That they will offer established prayer. They will give zakat. They will not uh, steal. They will not fornicate. They will not kill the children. They will not falsely accuse people of others. In the Sahih of Imam Muslim, Jarir bin Abdullah, he says, Bay'atu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I gave bay'ah to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I gave him a pledge. On what? On jihad? No. On being a Muslim? No. On you being Amir al-Mu'mineen and I'm going in jihad? No. On ala iqami salah wa ita'i zakah wa nusha li kulli muslim. I pledge with him that, O Messenger of Allah, I will offer my prayers from today. I will give zakat from today. I will provide advice and counsel to every Muslim. So this is, it's established. But 
for you know it's very important that even though it's established don't make this the aim purpose goal objective of tasawwuf and tazkiyatul qalb somebody wants to do that fine somebody doesn't want to no problem objective is tazkiyatul qalb unfortunately we are living in a time where we'll spend 10 hours debating whether this bay'ah is you should have a shaykh or not and the whole objective it's like 10 hours eating ice cream and the main food you're avoiding it we argue that ice cream no brother ice cream is far no it's not, not it's not far you should have ice cream after after food no you should have you know just some nice cake or something you you're talking about the, the you know just the peripheral issues the dessert and the starters and the main food you just don't want to eat forget about the, the starters and the desserts people can argue somebody doesn't want to somebody doesn't want to fine but the central obligation is what this is what it is basically every single character trait take every individual i'm coming to an end every individual character trait one by one look at hasad it's for the ayn upon every one of us that we remove this disastrous dangerous disease of jealousy the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam what did he say la tahasadu do not do not what have jealousy and hatred towards one another do not have jealousy and hatred towards one another iyakum wal hasad there's a hadith of sunan of imam abu dawood beware of jealousy jealousy eats away all your good deeds like fire eats away wood now this is the objective to be a spiritual person you need to see do i have jealousy work for years for months for days on removing this blameworthy character trait find somebody who will help you and guide you if you want and if you don't want to that's up to you but at least do this for the basic removal of this dangerous disastrous destroying disease if you have that disease and you have few you have that disease in your heart and you have 10 million sheikhs you're not a sufi and you don't have that disease and you don't have no sheikh you're a sufi unfortunately this is a problem because we have our focus in tasawwuf in this day and age is all on what bay'ah sufi sheikh this cult, that group, this tariq, that tariq, our group, we are distinguished from them. We all dress, all the, you know, we all have wear the same type of hat, so we all look similar. We all wear the same color. We all try the same, same cars. It's become a cult. Really, it's become a cult in some places. That's not the objective. There's diseases, the, the, the reason why Tasawwuf came into existence, that, re, that main thing is not found in the people of Tasawwuf. Some, not all I'm saying. So, there's jealousy. My sheikh, your sheikh. Jealousy between two groups. The whole objective for you to come into the science of tasawwuf was not to have jealousy. Yet now, like one of my friends was saying, is a sheikh, a famous sheikh. He says, I think the most spiritual diseases are on the people of tasawwuf in this day and age. I don't know if it's true or not, but it's found. And sometimes you might find some normal individual who has nothing to do with no Sufi group order. And he has a clean heart like you can never imagine. Is he more Sufi or that person who's got going to all these different groups with his sheikh? This individual, Allah loves these kind of people. Rajulun ash'atha aghbar. The hadith, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what did he say? Rajulun ash'atha aghbar. Law aqsama ala Allahi la barra. There are sometimes people who are disheveled, disheveled clothing, hair, clean hearted people. They are such that if they were to take an oath on Allah, Allah would make that happen. Sometimes we take these kind of people for granted. You know some man who comes to the mosque and he just puts the chairs in the corner. Nobody gives him any importance. He's just, you know, just a simple, clean-hearted individual. This is what I call a Sufi. Seriously, they, these are the type of people. Allah loves them far more than some of us who we think we are clever and sharp. Clean-hearted people who have concern for everybody. There's a hadith in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad. Rahimahullah, a famous, the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was once sitting with his companions and he said, يطلع, I think I mentioned this before, يطلع الآن عليكم رجل من أهل الجنة, a man, the next man soon to appear will be a man of paradise. So the sahaba looked and they saw that Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas has entered. The second day the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, same remark, 
man soon to enter the masjid will be a man of paradise. They saw it's again Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. Same story the next day. One of the other companions, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al As, he said, after three days, I ran behind him and I said to him, well, I kind of tricked him, but I said to him that, look, I have some issues at home. I just want to stay with you for a few days. I didn't tell him why, but I wanted to know and see and know for myself what was he doing at home so unique that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, described him as a man of Jannah. He probably is offering tahajjud prayer all night long and doing this and doing that. I stayed with him for three nights. He said, I saw him doing nothing. He prays the Isha, Witr goes to sleep. In the middle of the night, he might wake up, he might stretch his hands and just say, La ilaha illallah, or one or two dhikr, and go back to sleep. Not even tahajjud prayer. That doesn't mean we shouldn't, we should pray. But at that time, he wasn't praying. And he said, uh, he wasn't um, he, he, offering tahajjud prayer. And he carried on, and he said he would wake up for Fajr Salah and go to sleep. Uh, after Fajr, he would go to sleep, but he wouldn't do any, no ibadah. I didn't see anything major with him. Nothing major with him. So, after three days, he said, I couldn't resist, but ask him. He said, look, the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, called you a man of Jannah. What is, what, what is that you know, quality, that attribute, that something that you're doing? He said, ma huwa illa ma ra'it. This is a hadith sahih in the Muslim of Imam Ahmad. Ma huwa illa ma ra'it. Whatever you see, this is what I have. I don't do nothing. غير أني لا أجد في قلبي لأحد من المسلمين غش ولا أحسد على خير أعطاه الله إياه ولا أحسد أحدا على خير أعطاه الله إياه أن نذ الرواية هسال ولي أخذ مضجعي وليس في قلبي غمر لأحد من المسلمين I sleep at night he says I can only think of one thing every night when I take my bed when I go to sleep I sleep in a state that I have nothing negative towards any Muslim this is what you call a Sufi. No matter how much big dhikr a person is doing and how much Sufi gathering is going to, any resentment, animosity, hatred in the heart, you've got nothing. Nothing. You don't, you're not even close to tasawwuf. Not even, you haven't even tasted the flavor of it. This is what you call a Sufi. This is what you call tazkiyatul qalb. The companions were the highest level of tazkiyatul qalb. And this is why some people said earlier on that in the early times, tasawwuf was a reality. Sufism was a reality without a name. Now it's a name without a reality. In the earlier times, it was a reality that lived in every single Muslim without a name. Now we, everybody wants to make a big deal out of it, but the reality, very few people have it. So this is what's important. Every single spiritual disease, jealousy, combat it. If you have a shaykh, what do you do? You take his counsel, you take his advice, you take him as a teacher, guide. And that's why the scholars say that, look, you, you inform, you try to get the solutions, and then you obey and command, uh, the, obey the command and follow those solutions. If the, you, you have a spiritual disease of lust, lustful nature. You know, you can't preserve your eyesight. Every time your, your eye, your gaze is wandering around unlawful things. You teach, you speak to the shaykh, the spiritual guide, or the teacher, whoever it is. I say, look, I have this. Tell me something from the Quran and Sunnah. What are the um, remedies? What are the ways? You know, how, how, I mean, if you've combated that illness that you, how did you combat it? Can you teach me? This is, this is, how, this is what you call tasawwuf. And then acting upon it. It's a process. It's a system. It's, it's a course that carries on all day long. And I was saying that I know some sheikhs, they, they don't even do this bay'ah issue. Pledge. I know one student who went to a sheikh. And he said, look, I want to give a bay'ah. He said, forget bay'ah, we'll do it. He, said, he doesn't have a problem with it. He said, well, think about it. That's not really the real essence and objective of the sawf is to start work. Right? He was in another country. He said, he said don't worry. When I'll get time, maybe whenever, we'll do the bay'ah. Don't worry. That's, but the real objective is to start work. So from today, write everything down. How much salah you've missed, how much backbiting, how much this, that. Start working on yourself. If you are jealous, if you've broken ties with people, your family members, relatives, one by one, start going, seeking forgiveness. Start the work, start the job. This is what the sawf is. And he asked him after six months, he thought the sheikh forgot about bay'ah. He said, oh bay'ah, yeah, yeah. We'll get time, we'll do it. He, he told me this brother, he's a sheikh himself, that it was about 12 years and sheikh still hadn't bay given no bay'ah. And, and he was, he was a guy, he, was, he became, the sheikh gave him ijazah into taking bay'ah from others, but he never gave bay'ah. There was no pledge. 
Because that's, if you've got time, alhamdulillah, if not, don't worry about it, it's not a big deal. Real objective is to start working on the heart. That's why this is what we call islah, and this is what we call tasawwuf, and this is called tasqiyatul qalb, and the brothers are moving and they want me to, I think, finish. I said 12, and you said yes, carry on. So no, I'm going to finish, inshallah. And finally, but I will just say one thing, and then we'll end, inshallah ta'ala, that um, this, this, is what, this is the objective of, as I said, tas, uh, uh, tasawwuf and Sufism. We must be very careful in this day and age, because we find two extremisms, we find two extremes within the Muslim community. One extreme on, on the right is that some people, they just outrightly object and reject the soul of Sufism altogether. Completely. Sufis, you know, I went to a university once and a lot of times. What do the Sufis say? I said, well, Sufis, is, is, is that some kind of like, you know, a sect like Christianity is what the Christians say or something? You know, why, why do the Sufis? They just have a very negative picture about tasawwuf there's two reasons for that that's one extreme complete refutation anything you, they just hear the word sufism tasawwuf suddenly there's a complete rejection of it haram bid'ah shirk you know all these things come into the mind there's two reasons for that one is the arabs say there's a qaida al insanu aduwu amma jahila an a human being is an enemy of something that he's ignorant of if I don't know the reality of something, I'll just naturally become an enemy. This is all wrong. If I go and investigate, oh, is this the truth? Right, right, okay, now it makes sense. That's one reason. They need to learn what truth the soul is. And the second reason why they become enemies or they reject outrightly is because of the other extreme found, which is of some people who claim to be Sufis, who actually in the name of the soul and Sufism, practice certain practices and do certain things which have nothing to do with let alone tasawwuf nothing to do with Islam and that's another extreme so that extreme I'll end with this extreme on the right they need to start learning about the true reality of tasawwuf spirituality Sufis and shaykhs and what it's all about it's basically what's in the Quran and Sunnah it's tazkiyatul qalb and nothing else some few peripheral issues you can have a difference of opinion Dhikr this way, this group, that this group dhikr individually, silently. It's a matter of ijtihad. Allah says, do dhikr. Ya yuhalladhina amanu dhkurullah dhikran kathira. You know, do it standing up, sitting down silently. You know, you can do it silently, loudly. Allah says in the Quran about Dawood, peace be upon him. وَسَخَرَّ مَعَ دَاوُدُ الْجِبَالِ يُسَبِّحْنَ وَالطَّيْرِ That we control the mountains and the birds to make dhikr with Dawood alayhi salatu of the taslim. You know why? So that he has more concentration. A person doing something himself sometimes might get bored, but if you have people around you, you might have more concentration. You, you, you study at university, you study on your own, you might just after 30 minutes go to sleep, but you have people around you, it, it helps you. These are just remedies, there are remedies. So these are peripheral issues. Somebody doesn't like it, fine. Somebody likes it, fine. These are just, don't, just don't go into those peripheral issues. Deal with the real purpose. In our argumentation and debate of the peripheral issues, we overlook the central obligation. So that's my advice to the people on the right. Learn about the truth of Sufism and the peripheral issues. It's a matter of ijtihad. Leave them. You want to do bay'ah, leave. If you want to, let people do it. It's not a problem. <coughs> on the other hand, the other extreme is, those, uh, is the extreme of those individuals who in the, la in the name of tasawwuf. They do things which have nothing to do with Islam. They take the soul to an extreme level. They violate the laws of Sharia. Ah. And when you go down that road, then you know what will happen to you? I'll give you an example of what happened. To, I met once when I was studying in Syria, in Damascus once. There was a masjid there. There was a dhikr masjid taking place. And I saw at the back, there's a couple of, I, I thought they were non-Muslims but you know, two individuals from the West sat there. So normally when I see people like that, you know, I go and talk to them because I think they, they speak English or whatever, because a lot, of, a lot of tourists come. So I went and uh, incidentally, they were from London. I said, oh, you guys are from London. I said, uh, you know, I talked to them and said, oh, so you're here. They came, this was a masjid named 
Masjid Ibn, Ibn Arabi because it was next to a place where one of the early Sufis, Muhyiddin Ibn Arabi, Rahimahullah, used to teach and his grave's next door to it. And so it's just a masjid there. It's a proper masjid, salah takes place. But in it, there was a gathering of dhikr taking place after salat al-fajr in the morning and uh, one of the shaykhs was there. So these two brothers were sitting, well, two individuals, the brothers, whatever, they were sitting, uh, leaning against a pillar. So after that, I went, I had a chat conversation with them and I said, oh, so mashallah, you've come here. He said, yeah, we love Syria and we love the, you know, especially, you know, there's a great saintly, godly individual, spiritual individual who's buried here and, you know, we're Sufis. I said, mashallah, I, you know, I thought, mashallah, these guys are Sufis. I was thinking, mashallah, there must be some really spiritual. I said, okay, mashallah. I, so when did you embrace Islam? He said, well, actually, we're not Muslims, but we're Sufis. <laughs> This is the extreme of the people who claim to be Sufis and they take it to an extreme level. You can't be a Sufi if you're not a Muslim. And seriously, these people, they think this, the Sufis has become like some spiritual, mystical path. There are non-Muslims you can see for your own self, don't, but if you want to, maybe just a glimpse of non-Muslims in circles, men and women, skirts and, you know, dresses too, just knee length, doing dhikr and saying, La ilaha illallah. It's on YouTube, go and check it out. <laughs> Seriously, there's European women, Western women, men, women, they, they, they've got dresses, skirts, and they, El Allah, El, and they do thicker like that. I mean, this is not the soul, it's got nothing to do with the soul. Basically, the soul is purification of the heart, which is from the Quran, which is from the Sunnah. May Allah grant us the tawfiq and to practice on the things that I said. وقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم.